What is going on guys, welcome back to the C++ tutorial series. In today's video we're going to talk about structs, so let us get right into it. Alright, so as the name already suggests, structs are used to represent data structures in C++. The basic idea is that you have a struct and you initialize it by saying struct uh, and then a name, I don't know, my struct. And then you say this is my struct here, ended up with a semicolon. And the idea behind a struct is that you combine multiple things into one structure. So for example, instead of saying, okay, I have an integer and a string and a boolean and they somehow relate to each other, you say I have a struct and this struct consists of an integer i, for example, an std string s, for example, and a boolean b, for example. This is just something here. Um, now this structure is one thing, it's one data structure. And in C++, it is a little bit like a class and an object. So for those of you who already know object-oriented programming from, from another language like Python or Java, for example, or C Sharp, uh, structs in C++ are almost like classes. Now, there are some differences. For example, the default, um, uh, the, the, the members are public by default in a struct. It's not like that for a class. Um, and also it's just not considered best practice to use structs for things that you would actually want to use classes and objects for. So the, the basic um, rule of thumb that you want to follow here is if you want to represent a data structure, a classic traditional data structure or something like that, you use a struct. And if you want to actually represent something like an object, like a human, like a book and so on, you go for a class and an object. But this is not the topic of today's video. So structs in C++ are much more like uh, classes, whereas in C, structs are really just data structures. You cannot go ahead and see and say, I have a void here, which is the method uh, or the function test. And this function goes ahead and see out test like that. So this is not something that you could do in C, at least as far as I know. You can point to a function and so on, but you cannot just have this function belongs to that struct and so on. Um, so what we can try here is we can just go ahead and say struct uh, my struct, I'm not even sure if we need the struct to be honest. Um, but I think we need it. Yes. Uh, M one, let's call it M one. And then we say M one dot I equals 20 and M one dot S equals hello. And then we have B, uh, M one dot B equals, uh, true like that. And then we can just go ahead and say STD C out m1i std and line and then we copy that and we print the individual values and last but not least we can also go ahead and say m1.test so we call the function from this struct so when we now compile this and run this what do we get here no member named b uh what is the problem here oh it's a boolean obviously this is not java so bool in C++ and then there you go. So we have 20, hello, one and test, one represents true. Um, and now the interesting thing is that those are not, uh, this is not the same as saying int i and string s and so on. Those values belong to this particular structure. So this structure m1 consists of an integer, a string, a boolean and a function. And we can create another one, we can say struct my struct m2 and we can try to print those values for m2 oh sorry in addition to that we can try to do that and you're going to see that we're going to get uh, different values or undefined values in fact because we don't have anything assigned yet um, so those are individual structures and we can manipulate them so the values of m1 are the values of m1 and the values of m2 are the values of m2. Now the function is the same in this case. So if I say m2 test, we're going to get the same result here. But if the function test, for example, prints uh, information of the struct. So if I say, okay, print i, s and b here, I'm going to get a different result for each struct. Now let's go ahead and do something useful. Let's not do my struct. Let's do a person. So we can say struct person. Again, as I said, person is usually something that you would want to model in a class. So in object oriented programming, but just for an example, we can use a struct for this as well. Uh, especially because this is useful if you're doing something in C or even in Go. In Go, you also don't have classes. You only have structures. 
Uh, so you can get used to that as well here. Uh, we can create a new human or a new person. We can say struct person p1 and this person shall have a name. So std string name. Then we have s uh, not std int age. And let's say we have character gender like that. And now what we do is we go ahead and say p1 dot name equals max p1 dot age equals 25 and p1 dot gender equals m for male. And we can copy this and have a second person here. And this is going to be Anna. She is 35 and F for female. Uh, of course, we need to change this to two here. There you go. And now we can also add a function here that just prints the info. So we can say something like um, void print info. And what we do here is we just say std see out name. I mean, yes, I could use formatting, but I'm going to do it like that right now. Um, I hope I don't need something like this here, but I think not. But we'll find out in a second. H, H, and gender, gender. Let's see if that works. We now just need to call this p one dot print info. And then the same thing for p two. So as you can see, it works, it can, uh, it can access the individual attributes. Uh, so this works, as you can see, more like a class in C, that's not possible, you cannot just do that in C, as far as I know, maybe I'm wrong, but as far as I know that you cannot do that in C. In C++, that's not a problem. And a struct can be treated like a class. Again, it's not, uh, it's not best practice. Uh, but one more thing that we can do here is we can look at the size. So we can also go ahead and say stdc out size of p1 just to see how much uh, or how many bytes this memory, uh, this structure allocates in the memory. So we can run this here and we're going to see 32 bytes. And I think for p2, it's going to be the same, obviously. I mean, hopefully, because I think maybe the name, I think the name shouldn't make much of a difference here. Maybe if I add a lot of ace, but even then I think that the string has already allocated more than it needs. Yeah. Uh, but we can see that there is a change if we add uh, something else here. So let's say I don't know, we have a float weight or something, even if we don't assign it, we still have a float. And because of that, we have four more bytes here. So that's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. If so, let me know by hitting a like button and leaving a comment in the comment section down below. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and hit the notification bell to not miss a single future video for free. Other than that, thank you very much for watching. See you in the next video and bye.